happy to welcome Peter back for, for day two, and I'll turn things back over to him. All right, uh, great. So welcome back. Uh, thanks again to the organizers for uh, what's been a great workshop so far, and I'm looking forward to uh, talks this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen here. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so let me maybe say a few things. So yesterday I gave an introduction to topological data analysis uh, uh, and hopefully all of you were there, but uh, if, if you weren't there, I will, I've made an effort to make this talk uh, self-contained. So uh, don't be scared if you missed anything yesterday. Uh, today's talk will be more focused on the theory of the subject and uh, but it's no way, ex no way exhaustive. So there's lots of kind of interesting connections between uh, this new branch of topology uh, with classical parts of the subject and other parts of math. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, explore those connections, whether or not they appear in my talk. Uh, all right, now the Uh, in, in topological data analysis, just to give you an overview, uh, usually we start off with some data that's been given to us maybe by uh, experimentalists, uh, experiments in science, engineering, or observations in, in those and other areas. And uh, we want to build some mathematical object out of that data that, on which we can do topology. Uh, so. Uh, one standard way of doing that is to build a diagram of spaces, and that's what I've been focusing on. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus on kind of one parameter families of spaces. And in tomorrow's talk, we'll look at uh, having more complicated diagrams of spaces. And uh, now, mathematically, we can always just work with diagrams of topological spaces, but computationally, uh, it's preferable if we have some finitely encoded spaces and finitely many of them. Uh, so uh, one convenient way to do that is to have diagrams of simplicial complexes, and in particular, diagrams in which all the maps are inclusion maps. Uh, so these will be called filtered simplicial complexes. And depending on the application, there's many ways to do this. Uh, but my focus is going to be on some of the simplest ways to do this. And the only thing I'd like to point out for those of you who are actually serious about doing applied mathematics, uh, the simplest construction probably isn't the best one. And you should think carefully about what the best uh, construction is for your data. Uh, all right, with those words of caution, let's look at uh, some of the standard constructions. And so we're going to start off with in the setting in which we are in a metric space. So we have a metric space Y, and then we have some subset of it X. And the, the one to keep in mind is maybe it's the simplest case and maybe the most important one is we have a finite uh, collection of points in Euclidean space. All right, so with that input data, uh, we now fix some non-negative real number R and we can look at the collection of balls uh, centered at the points in X. And that collection of balls has a union, which is now a subspace of our metric space. And the collection of balls covers the union of balls. And whenever we have a cover, there's a uh, construction called the nerve. Um, 
which in its simplest form gives us a simplicial complex. Uh, so let me show you one of these constructions here for various values of R. So on the left, we have a finite set of points in the plane. And now for increasing values of R, we get kind of increasing, uh, so collections of disks with a fixed radius, fixed but increasing radius. And notice the topology changes as we go through this sequence. And we can combinatorially encode that topology by a sequence of simplicial complexes. So the vertices are always the centers of the balls. The edges are given by uh, pairs of balls that intersect. And then whenever we have three balls with a mutual intersection, uh, we can put in a triangle. And I haven't shown those, but uh, and then we have four intersecting balls. We stick in a tetrahedron and so on. Uh, so this gives us a filtered simplicial complex. And uh, what's nice is that this combinatorial construction uh, does not lose any information from the point of view of uh, homotopy theory. So uh, this check complex, this, uh, uh, so this, each of these complexes is called the check complex in TDA. And uh, the homotopy type of the, so the geometric realization of the check complex is homotopy equivalent to this union of balls. Uh, now that's certainly true in Euclidean space. Uh, it's also true more generally. Uh, what do we need? We need that the intersections, if they are not empty, we need them to be contractible. And uh, so that works in general if we use open balls. Uh, a slight technical note is that in topological data analysis, most people use closed balls. Uh, for today, I'm going to use open balls because they're simpler. Uh, with closed balls, the story is a little more complicated. Uh, you need your ambient metric space to be paracompact, and you want your closed balls to be neighborhood retracts. Uh, all right, so um, now yesterday, if, if you were there yesterday, we kind of used a Morse theoretic point of view and we constructed subcomplexes using uh, sublevel sets of thresholds of the Morse function. Uh, this construction here seems very different from that, uh, but it actually is a special case of the sublevel set construction that we saw yesterday. And, uh, but it's not immediately obvious why that's the case. Uh, however, it is true. And what we need to do to, is to define this distance function D here. Uh, oops, I don't want it to go away. Uh, so we define D is this function from Y to R given by this definition here. Uh, so we take the infimum uh, to all the points in X. Okay, so, so now let's try to visualize what the sublevel sets of this function are. If we have finitely many points in X, uh, we fix a level R. This just says that we're within R of one of the points in our, our collection X. Uh, in other words, we're, we're within the union of balls. Okay, so this uh, check, well, what I'm calling this check complex or this union of balls is actually a sublevel set of a function. Um, now the tricky point is it's not a smooth function because it uses this min. Uh, so it has this kind of a min type Morse function and you can extend Morse theory to min type functions if you want to. Uh, all right. Now, the check complex is great because it really has the right homotopy type, uh, but it has some disadvantages. So in practice, people use variants of this in computations. In 
if we're in Euclidean space and in low dimensions, meaning two or three dimensions, uh, there is a more parsimonious version of the Czech complex called the uh, most commonly called the alpha complex, also called the Delaunay complex. And it's smaller, uh, but it can still be efficiently computed and it has the same homotopy type. Uh, so if you're in that setting, that's the thing you want to use computationally. Uh, but now in more general settings, if we're in higher dimensions, or if we don't have a Euclidean structure, uh, the right thing to do is something called the viatoris ribs complex. And this only uses pairwise intersections. So it's just a function of the distance matrix on those points. And so that's one advantage. Uh, another advantage is that it's easy to work with in an arbitrary metric space because we just have these pairwise distances. Uh, something that's a little more subtle uh, is not only is it faster to compute, but it's easier to store. We don't have to worry about higher order simplices. We just store the edges. Um, all right. And uh, due to this theorem by uh, De Silva and Greist, uh, in, at least in Euclidean space, it's somehow closely related to the Czech complex. Um, there's this, there, it's nested in both directions uh, by this formula here. Uh, kind of a higher level view of getting the Viatoris Rips complex from the Czech complex is that we look at the one skeleton of the Czech complex and then we just freely add in all the higher order simplices. Okay, um, there is a factor of two in there, depending on how you define things, because kind of one of them uses the radius and the other one uses the diameter. Uh, but ignoring that, the viatoris Rips complex is just the uh, clique complex or the flag complex on the one skeleton of the check complex. All right, <laughs> okay. So in either case, for all of these options, what we have is a filtered simplicial complex. So we have an increasing collection of simplices. And uh, so that's the definition we have here at the bottom of the screen. All right. Um, something I forgot to mention at the beginning is please ask questions as I'm going along. Uh, again, I'm happy to be interrupted. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, maybe use the chat feature, which is being monitored, and, uh, and, and the organizers will interrupt me to ask, to allow you to ask your questions. Um, or if that doesn't work, I can just go ahead in there and unmute yourself and, and jump in. Um, Peter, there is a question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the question is, how do we choose R? How do we choose R? Fantastic question. Uh, we don't. <laughs> All right, we're mathematicians. Uh, we don't like making choices. Uh, and we are willing to consider infinitely many things at once and have them all in our heads. Uh, so uh, something, if you look at the computer science or engineering literature on related things, uh, much attention is devoted to choosing right, making the right choice of parameters. And uh, one thing I like to show in talks and I didn't show here is that uh, in many examples, there is no one right choice of scale. So we see uh, diff interesting features at different scales. And uh, as mathematicians, we can consider all scales at once. Okay, this is our superpower. We are able to look at big things, infinite things and come up with structures that encode all of that information. Uh, so uh, a short version of topological data analysis is that's what we're doing exactly, is looking at uh, putting all this information together at once and then kind of summarizing it in the right way. And that's mathematically interesting and challenging and, and that's what we're doing. Uh, so we have all of these simplicial complexes. We look at all of them at once and then we take homology, not just of one of them, but of all of them. And uh, we take coefficients, so homology, uh, 
let's do kind of one degree at a time. So we fix a degree of homology uh, and then we fix coefficients in a field so that we get vector spaces. Uh, and now we have this collection of vector spaces, uh, one for each real number. Um, earlier, we only it's worked with non-negative real numbers. Uh, we can extend to the other ones just by taking empty spaces. Homology gives us the zero vector space. Uh, so now for every real number, we have a vector space. And moreover, because we had inclusions of simplicial complexes, there's induced maps by homology, we get linear maps. So All right, Peter, there's a couple of other questions in the chat. Module. Great. Uh, one of them is, do we never represent small simplices in the torus rips complex? Do we never represent small simplices? I'm not sure I understand that. Yeah, Rishad, do you want to ask your question more specifically? Yeah, so um, as I understand it, um, whenever you have um, a triangle, um, you just fill it in, right? In the Vietnamese yes. Rips complex. Yes. Um, do you never represent a triangle just as it is, as a, without filling it in? So the triangles are there, they're in the complex. We don't need to store them. So they're, whenever the boundary of the triangle is there, the triangle is also there, so. But, but it becomes contractible. It doesn't become like, you don't have like the triangle without filling it in, right? We cannot have a triangle in a Viatoris Rips complex without filling it in, correct. Okay. So it's kind of a smaller collection of simplices than we can get with the Czech complex, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. However, if you, if you really want a triangle, just add in more dots. So do like a very centric subdivision and, uh, so the, the smallest uh, one simplex that's a via one dimensional uh, simplicial complex that's a via torus rips complex that is not contractible is the square. Uh, so yeah, uh, so we, we only have to go a little bit further. Uh, more generally, uh, re so boundaries of simplices are always filled in, uh, but boundaries of octahedra, uh, and there's kind of higher dimensional versions of these things do not need to be filled in. Thanks, Peter. And then there's just a, a note, maybe some care that, that you're using D for two different things, the dimension uh -oh. and the distance. <laughs> Am I? Yes. Sorry. Apologies. Um, yeah, D for metric spaces is kind of unavoidable. And I'm also using D for the dimension of the Euclidean space when I talk about a Euclidean spaces. Uh, but I won't be doing that so often. So hopefully that won't cause more, too much trouble. Um, people tend to use N there, but because I'm, I'm thinking of samples of points, I want to save N for uh, samples. So, all right, I will, I will try to fix that in future. Sorry about that. Okay, persistence modules. Uh, so we have these nice, these are our algebraic objects. Of course, we also need to define maps between them. So what's a map between persistence modules? Uh, so let me kind of sketch a persistence module M. Uh, I'm going to visualize it as a real line. Every point on the real line has a vector space attached to it. Uh, if we go from the left to the right, we have a linear map. Now, if we have two such persistence modules, uh, with all of these linear maps, a morphism between them consists of a collection of maps that go down vertically. And the condition is that everything commutes. Okay, so that gives us a morphism of persistence modules. All right. Um, what's the simplest case of such a thing? So uh, for vector spaces, the simplest vector space or the fundamental vector space uh, is maybe not the zero vector space because it's somehow trivial, it's the one-dimensional vector space, okay? The analog of the one-dimensional vector space for persistence modules is an interval module. Uh, so this is a 
collection of one dimensional vector spaces uh, supported by an interval. And outside of the interval, we have the zero dimensional vector space. Inside the interval, we have the one dimensional vector space. And then all of the maps within the interval are identity maps. All right, and now there's a notational thing that's very convenient, but uh, could cause confusion just right now until you hear me explain this, which is that it's convenient to denote the interval module by the same letter as the interval, okay? So, um, uh, so let me, what I've written, what I have a picture of here is a graph of the dimension of the interval module J. So J here is the interval module. So for each real number, there's a vector space that has a dimension. And I have here a graph of that so that we see that the support, so the support of the dimension of J is equal to J. All right, so here we're using J as the interval module and here we're using J as the interval. All right, so hopefully that is clear. All right, so these are very special interval modules, but it turns out that in many cases we can build, just like with vector spaces being built out of one dimensional vector spaces, we can build uh, persistence modules out of interval modules. So there's a collection of interval decomposable persistence modules, which are isomorphic to direct sums of interval modules. All right, now, I need to say a few things for that statement to make sense. So in vector spaces uh, and in many other kind of algebraic categories like groups and uh, we can, abelian groups, we can take direct sums. So the structure that we need is we need to be in an abelian, we need to be in an abelian category. And it turns out that uh, persistence modules uh, are an abelian category. So maybe you haven't seen this notion. And this is just, what does this mean? It means we have kind of the algebraic structure for taking direct sums. Uh, we can take kernels, co-kernels, uh, all the kinds of things we like to do in algebra, we can do in persistence modules. Uh, so, in particular, it makes sense to talk about direct sums of interval modules uh, and the interval and, and also decomposition of persistence modules. So uh, the interval decomposable persistence modules are those that are isomorphic to direct sums of interval modules. Uh, okay, so these here are interval modules. And one of the big theorems of persistent homology is a structure theorem telling us uh, that we can often do this. So this is uh, a result due to Bill Crawley Bevy. And it says that, so if, if for all real numbers, the persistence, the vector space M sub R is finite dimensional, Uh, then M is interval decomposable. Okay, so this is a great result. It's very useful. And what it tells us is that uh, the persistence module up to isomorphism can be completely described or characterized by a collection of intervals. Okay, uh, so this collection of intervals is called the barcode of the persistence module. And 
this is what it looks like, or this is, so we can draw those intervals by just stacking them on top of each other. The order doesn't have any information. Uh, and that's a great visualization of a persistence module. Uh, it starts to break down once we get too many intervals and they don't fit on our screen anymore. Uh, so, so what is often used instead is a persistence diagram in which we just plot the endpoints of the interval. Okay, it loses a slight amount of inf slight amount of information because we don't keep track of whether or not the endpoints of the interval are included or not. Okay, but this is the uh, summary that I will usually be using of persistence modules. All right, so. So we've seen the structure theorem. Uh, next, I wanna show two of the other fundamental theorems of uh, persistent homology, the stability theorem and the isometry theorem. Uh, so I need to remind you of a distance that was introduced yesterday, the Wasserstein distance. And so if we have two persistence diagrams, uh, so let's call D, is, D is gonna be, the consist of the uh, orange dots and D prime is gonna consist of the blue circles. Uh, the Wasserstein distance is given by taking bijections of these or matchings of these. And the technical trick is that we are allowed to match uh, points with po the nearest point on the diagonal. Okay, so think about shrinking an interval down to uh, the interval of length zero centered at its midpoint, uh, which is an interval is a point. Uh, so that makes sense. And then we kind of can freely add those intervals of length zero to persistence diagrams. Uh, and so that gives us a bunch of numbers. We take the P norm of those numbers, take the infimum over all possible matchings. Uh, that gives us the P Wasserstein distance. And again, that works for all uh, we need to fix some p between one and, and infinity. And uh, a property of this construction, which uh, I'll show up later if we, if we have time, is that it's p sub additive. So it kind of works nicely with an additive structure on persistence diagrams where we just add in dots here. So taking the disjoint union of persistence diagrams. All right. Okay. So with that, now that I've reminded you of that, I can state uh, a very important theorem uh, for persistent homology, which is that it is stable. Uh, so broadly speaking, if we perturb our data by epsilon, uh, the output, meaning the persistence diagram, will also only be perturbed by epsilon. Uh, so this is very much something that you want in applied mathematics, uh, but it's actually kind of rare to have this. And one of the strengths of uh, topological data analysis is that we often have these types of theorems. Uh, and this is kind of one of the, the main versions of this. And so to remind you, X and Y here are metric spaces. Um, they can't be general metric spaces. Uh, it turns out what is needed is that they are totally bounded. Uh, and, and, and what is, is certainly sufficient is that they are finite. Uh, so we start off with these metric spaces. We build the viatoris rips complex on that. We take its homology. Uh, we, uh, we get the persistence diagram on that. Uh, and the infinity Wasserstein distance between those is bounded by twice the gromov hausdorff distance between those metric spaces. All right, so to remind you, the Gromov, there's different ways to define the gromov hausdorff distance, uh, one of which is to uh, embed 
those two metric spaces into a bit, isometrically embed those two metric spaces into a bigger metric space, and then take the Hausdorff distance in that bigger metric space and take the infimum over all such embeddings. All right. Uh, that's kind of an abstract one. There, there's, there's some other ones that are a little more concrete. Um, okay, so this, this is really a, a useful kind of practical theorem for justifying using these methods in applications. All right, uh, there's an, another definition, there's another metric uh, for persistence modules uh, that's more algebraic. Uh, and this is something that's now found uses in other parts of pure math, like symplectic topology, uh, called the interleaving distance. So if you remember the maps of persistence modules were required to go kind of straight up, straight down. And in applied settings, it's actually very rare that you have kind of non-trivial maps that go straight down and commute everywhere. Uh, but if we allow ourselves a little bit of wiggle room, meaning allow ourselves to shift forward by epsilon with our maps, uh, then we're much more likely to have such maps. So an epsilon interleaving consists of maps in both directions that are allowed to shift forward by epsilon and are then require we then require that just all the maps commute. Okay, so this is called an epsilon interleaving. And the observation is that if epsilon is equal to zero, that's exactly the same thing as an isomorphism. All right, so this is a kind of quantitative weakening of isomorphism, all right? And if you're a homotopy theorist, this should kind of uh, make you feel good because kind of weakening notions of isomorphism is an important thread in that subject. All right, so the interleaving distance is the infimum over all epsilon for which there exists at such an interleaving. And a great theorem called the isometry theorem is that this New distance is the same as the old distance. So the infinity of Wasserstein distance between uh, the persistence diagrams of two modules is the same as the interleaving distance. So this kind of more algebraic distance is the same as that kind of more combinatorial one. Uh, there is a slight technical point here, which is that if you remember, I said that not all persist, I think I maybe said, or I should have said, that not all persistence modules actually, for that, let me start again. For the structure theorem of Crawley Bevy, uh, we did have the uh, condition that the persistence modules were pointwise finite dimensional. If you drop that condition, it's not actually true that all persistence modules decompose into interval modules. Uh, so, for because of that reason, not all persistence modules have persistence diagrams. Uh, so we need to kind of ensure that we have persistence diagrams. So uh, this theorem works if we have pointwise finite dimensional persistence modules, which is always the case computationally. And it can be slightly generalized to something called q tame persistence modules, uh, which re require that all the kind of forward maps in the persistence modules are finite dimensional. All right. Okay, so the last part of my talk was all algebra, and now I want to get back to ge ge geometry and topology. Uh, we have this nice summary of persistence modules, the persistence diagram, and we have a metric on it, or a family of metrics on it. Uh, so we have a metric space, and so a natural thing to ask is, well, what can we say about the geometry and topology of this metric space? And uh, so it's a great mathematical question, but it's also a good question uh, from an applied point of view, because if you want to do statistics or machine learning on a metric space, uh, you want it to have kind of nice topological and geometric properties. So I'm going to start off with some good news. So there'll be, it's going to be good news and bad news from the uh, applied point of view. 
And of course, mathematically, it's all good news. The results, learning stuff is good news. But uh, so one piece of good news is that this metric space is complete and separable. Okay, so uh, so this is sometimes called a Polish space. And if we're in a Polish space, then uh, we have enough structure to do probability theory. So that's kind of good for doing statistics. Um, now, uh, this res these two results kind of tell us that the space is small in some sense, can be kind of probed or understood with finite sequences or kind of countable constructions. Um, but next I have some bad news, <laughs> uh, which is that this space here, even though it's kind of countably described above, is, is, is still big in, in a couple specific bad ways. Um, so first off, it's not locally compact anywhere. So pick any persistence diagram and using this, any of these P. Wasserstein distances, uh, there's no neighborhood that's compact. So let me give you kind of an idea behind the problem here. Uh, the idea is that uh, there, there's, there's lots of room at the bottom, okay? And the, the, the bottom is the diagonal, kind of the small intervals, lots of room near the diagonal. And in particular, you can pick kind of points that get closer and closer to the diagonal, and you can pick multiple, you can have higher multiplicities uh, and kind of arbitrary, you can have, take points, sequence of points getting close to the diagonal and start increasing the multiplicity of those. And that allows you to, to construct persistence, kind of a sequence of persistence diagram, all of which are uh, kind of within an epsilon ball of the empty diagram, but are all kind of some delta apart from each other. Okay, so, um, so because of that, no point is, uh, no neighborhood of a persistence diagram is, is compact. All right. Um, so let me give you another result, kind of showing you how big these, this metric space is. So this is only for the P equals infinity case. Uh, so together with my, my former student, Alex Wagner, who's now a postdoc at Duke, uh, we showed that if you take any separable bounded metric space, it isometrically embeds in this metric space of persistence diagrams. All right, so the space is big. There's lots of things in there. This is kind of a huge family of things and all of them isometrically embed in there. All right, uh, this result will show up again uh, later, we'll, we'll take advantage of those. All right, uh, something that's, that's a little simpler to visualize is that uh, the space of persistence diagrams doesn't have unique means. And then there's a very simple example of this. So on the left here, I have uh, two persistence diagrams, each of which have exactly two points, two dots. Uh, so there's the the pink one and then the or, uh, orange one or yellow one. So D and D prime each have two points. And there's two persistence diagrams with two points that are kind of halfway between these two persistence diagrams. And there's kind of two midpoints. And it comes from the fact that we can match these the dots in the two persistence diagrams optimally in two different ways, either vertically or horizontally. Uh, if we do it horizontally, 
there is the green persistence diagram, which would be kind of here. And that's halfway between those two persistence diagrams. And if we match them vertically, we have this blue triangle persistence diagram, which would look like this, which is also halfway between them. All right. Um, so we don't have unique means. And if you're paying very careful attention, you might ask, well, what, what is a mean in a metric space? Uh, so the, the notion of mean here is Frechet mean. So if you're interested, you can look that up what that exactly is. Uh, now in a Hilbert space, we have unique Frechet means. So because of this, this, this gives us an obstruction to isometric embeddings into a Hilbert space. And I talked about yesterday how we would really like to be in a Hilbert space. Uh, so this is kind of bad news. Now, uh, Isometric embeddings are, are pretty strong, strict. Maybe we can weaken this. Maybe we can have like a Lipschitz embedding uh, or uh, maybe we can just have a coarse embedding. Coarse geometries appeared in a few talks already yesterday. Um, so this is a notion of Gromov's, which loosens kind of a, a bi-Lipschitz embedding instead of having constants uh, scalar constants kind of giving us inequalities in the two metrics. We have arbitrary uh, non-decreasing functions. And the important thing is that these functions only depend on the distance and not the points in the metric space. All right, so if you haven't seen this definition before, uh, just replace those functions with uh, scalar multiples and then you get a more strict notion of, of bi-Lipschitz embedding. All right, uh, so what Alex and I showed is that there in fact does not, we can't even have a coarse embedding of these persistence diagrams into Hilbert space. Uh, so we showed that for p equals infinity. Alex later uh, generalized that to p greater than two. Uh, for p less than or equal to, it's open. Uh, so, is open, so there's a, a problem to think about, work on. I'd be very excited if anybody had anything to say about that. Um, let me very briefly say something about the proof. Uh, it uses this idea that we can kind of stick arbitrary spaces into our space of persistence diagrams. And there's certain kind of bad spaces that are known to have properties that uh, our obstructions to embedding into Hilbert space. Uh, so in particular, we use, uh, make use of the construction of uh, Dronishnikov and collaborators from 2002 uh, that they use to give a negative answer to a question of Gromov's whether or not any separable metric space could be coarsely embedded into Hilbert space. And so that's a work from 2002 and their construction is based on an earlier construction of N-flow from 1969. And he used, his construction gave a negative answer to a question of Smirnoff's uh, of whether or not any separable metric space could be isometrically embedded into Hilbert's space. Um, so, so there's an interesting kind of geometric topological story there. Um, sorry, not isometrically embedded, uniformly embedded into uh, Hilbert space. All right, okay. I have a little bit of time left. I have one more uh, collection of results that I, I wanna talk about. And these take a um, kind of, arithmetic or algebraic view of persistence diagrams. And I've mostly been talking about them as subsets or collections of points in the plane or this half plane. And 
A better thing to say maybe is that they are formal sums. Uh, so formal sums, we can add them. So there's this additive structure. And uh, so we should think about, about what, what the, what's mathematical structure we are working with. Uh, so one thing to say is that we are persistence diagrams in this case, finite persistence diagrams are elements of the free commutative monoid of the upper half plane. Now, that is good, but maybe not the best thing to do because it, it's ignoring the diagonal, which kind of plays a special role here. So an equivalent and slightly better thing to do say is that it's the quotient of the free commutative monoid on the closed half plane modulo the free commutative monoid on its boundary, which is the diagonal. So all the points with x equals y. So we have all the points with x less than or equal to y, free commutative monoid on that, uh, quotient by the free commutative monoid on all the points, all the pairs where x equals y. And so let me denote this uh, kind of more simply as the kind of free commutative monoid on this pair. And now the other ingredient that we have here is there's an underlying metric on the plane that we're taking advantage of. So, so we really want to be working with a triple, which in our case is going to be R2 less than or equal to a metric and R2 equals, which is the diagonal. So we have the half plane, metric on it, and a subset of that. All right, so let's call that a metric pair. And uh, we have a category of metric pairs uh, where the morphisms are given by one Lipschitz maps, so non-expansive maps. And there is a Kind of a special case of this is where the subspace is only allowed to be a single point. Uh, so that gives us a subcategory of uh, pointed metric spaces, which is maybe uh, more uh, a more standard thing to look at. And we can go from a metric pair to a pointed metric space just by collapsing that subspace. We can collapse the diagonal, for example, down to a point, and then that quotient set has an induced metric, or the, the quotient metric. All right. Okay. So, so once we have this mathematical structure in hand, uh, what can we do with it? So, um, So let me fix a number p between one and infinity. And uh, one thing to observe is that if we take a product of metric spaces, uh, there's different ways to put a metric on the product, right? So we take distances kind of coordinate wise, and now we have two distances. And we want to turn those two numbers into one number. Uh, so the p norm gives us a one parameter way of doing that. And now all of those give us equivalent metrics. So it's kind of a choice that we can mostly ignore, uh, but I don't want to ignore it. And uh, what, I, what I'd like to observe is that all of these different choices of P give us a different product and kind of using a bit more machinery uh, they give us different symmetric monoidal products on the category of pointed metric spaces. Okay, so uh, we have this algebraic structure, a symmetric, symmetric monoidal category. And if you have a symmetric monoidal category, you can look at uh, commutative monoids internal to that symmetric monoidal category. Uh, let me do that, and let me just say, uh, what we have now is uh, kind of metric spaces with an additive structure. And it turns out that there is a functorial way to go from a point from a metric pair into one of these 
things. And uh, this functorial construction gives us exactly what we've been working with. So if we start off with our metric pair here, and we apply this functorial or universal or canonical construction, we get exactly persistence diagrams with the P Wasserstein distance. All right, so to me, this is very pleasing because the, the construction that I've been showing you, it kind of looks a little ad hoc, uh, though it seems like it's kind of the right thing. And this theorem tells us, yes, it is the right thing because it's, it's the, it really is the right kind of functorial construction. There's no choices involved here. If we just set up the right category, uh, we have this, there's a forgetful functor into our starting category and the, the left adjoint to that is, which is left adjoints or universal constructions. This is the right thing. Okay. Uh, so, so as a corollary to that is that the P Wasserstein distance is the largest piece of additive metric on persistence diagrams. Okay, so I'm just gonna end my talk with a souped up version of this because once we start thinking about building bigger and bigger things, we wanna just keep getting bigger and bigger. And something we saw yesterday is that there's cases where we wanna take not just formal sums, but signed sums. Uh, so instead of taking free commutative monoids, we want to take free abelian groups. Uh, so we do the exact same thing with free abelian groups. Now actually P equals one is kind of required because in most cases with P bigger than one, the, the metrics that you end up getting end up being trivial. Uh, so restricted to P equals one, we can do the same thing. We have kind of uh, universal constructions. And uh, so this is the result that we get here. So, so here we have persistence diagrams with the one Wasserstein distance. Uh, those are given by free commutative monoids. If we go up to free abelian groups, we get an isometric embedding into uh, something I like to call virtual persistence diagrams. Uh, now those have our kind of dots in our metric space with integer coefficients. Uh, well, let's generalize that. Let's take real coefficients. If we do that, then we have a free vector space, free real vector space on our underlying metric space. We can isometrically embed into that. And let's go one step further. Let's take the Cauchy completion uh, of, those, uh, of, the, of those vector spaces. Then we get a free uh, Bonnock space. All right, so, so we said for P greater than two, we don't have in, course embedding into a Hilbert space, but if we're willing to live with Bonnock spaces, then for P equals one at least, we have an isometric embedding of persistence diagrams into a Bonnock space, and we can do it in this functorial way. And with that, I will end my talk. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope I have questions, so please ask questions. I've got one. Maybe I missed this, but what's a virtual persistence diagram? Uh, it's so it's just a, a persistence diagrams in which the the dots are allowed. To, so, sorry. First, let me say what a persistence diagram is. So, I've usually drawn them as kind of a, a, a set of points in an underlying metric space, which in in the usual case is the half, kind of this upper half plane with what, uh, x less than or equal to y. Uh, now, in fact, uh, those dots are allowed to have multiplicity, right? In the barcode, you're allowed to repeat intervals. So 
their formal sums, meaning kind of dots with non-negative multiplicity are persistence diagrams. And then the virtual persistence diagrams are allowed to have negative multiplicity. Uh, so they are functions from your metric space to the integers that have finite support. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, so, so obviously this diagonal plays a pretty important role in what's going on here, but it, it, it also seems to be what's causing the problem with uh, the niceness of your topological space. And so I'm, I'm wondering, is it ever useful to sort of view points near the diagonal as being just noise and improve your space by perhaps throwing out everything um, of, of length less than a certain epsilon? Uh, so that is certainly a point of view that is taken. And um, uh, and if you do that, life becomes much more simple. And in fact, you can, if you make a stronger assumption that uh, maybe you only have at most n points that are all at least epsilon away from the diagonal, uh, then you are in a much simpler setting geometrically and topologically, and you're essentially in Euclidean space when you've done that. So you're essentially in R to the 2n. Uh, and and then, then you're just, then everything is simple. <laughs> so if, if that's what you're looking for, if you want your life to be simple, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and do that. Um, but I don't do that, uh, so I, I kind of I kind of advocate the opposite point of view. Okay. Uh, life isn't simple. Uh, I think the that diagonal is kind of the most important thing about the persistence diagram, and it's it's the source of all the difficulty. Uh, and I think wishing it away is, is not the right thing point of view to do, both you know, from an applied point of view and from a a mathematical point of view. Uh, there are, there is an applied point of view, which is that the points close to the diagonal are noise. Uh, however, that's, that's in my point of view, kind of the original view of topological data analysis. And I think the view has shifted, <laughs> or at least I'm certainly an advocate of the opposite point of view, which is, um, so initially I think the feeling was that TDA would be useful for detecting topology, meaning homology classes of large scale structures, big holes and voids. Uh, and, and something I discussed in the discussion session yesterday was that computationally big voids are sometimes hard to detect because if you're missing a cap on your sphere, then you kind of don't see it. Uh, now what the methods actually end up being very good at detecting is local geometry. So places where you have lots of points together, uh, but the distribution of that point somehow says something about the geom local geometry. And the little holes that are more transient and to the naked eye look like noise because they appear and disappear. Uh, there's lots of them, okay? So if you have lots of points, we have lots of little homology that appears and disappears quickly. Uh, humans are not maybe so good at recognizing it, but once we start doing computations with computers, uh, the computer is actually very good at finding subtle differences between local geometric structures based on topological data analysis. And this is one of the big strengths of these tools. And that all comes from point, lots and lots of points that are really close to the diagonal. Uh, and in making efficient use of that information really depends on having a good handle on the geometry and metric structure. Uh, so we really want to kind of make the right choices and really understanding the geometry and topology there.
And so that's where the, in my mind, that's the real interesting part of this. And there's, the math is really interesting. Okay. Uh, Rick, do you want to ask your Sure. I had several things occurred to me uh, while you were talking. One was, does the choice of P in the P of Oscherstein distance, does that have some practical import when you're doing applications? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so theoretically, the one that's favored uh, is the P equals infinity case because we have this isometry theorem and the interleaving distance is kind of nicest to work with mathematically. It's very algebraic, it's very categorical. Uh, it can be vastly generalized. Which is, what is interleaving distance? So that was, uh, yeah, let me, let me start sharing my screen again so we can take a look at that. So, so interleaving distance um, used um, kind of just linear algebra or just algebra. Uh, it was the existence of certain maps making everything commute, kind of sufficiently many of them. And as we as I might discuss a little bit tomorrow, this allows us, so there's kind of an underlying indexing object here, which is the real numbers, uh, and, but that can be replaced with other partially ordered sets and the definition still makes sense. And that ends up being very useful for extending persistence to more general objects. Uh, so, uh, so from that point of view, P equals infinity is the best. <laughs> uh, but of course, what's the easiest to generalize is not necessarily the best thing in applications. And from an applied point of view, P equals infinity is the worst. And it's the worst because it's the least sensitive. So if we go back to the persistence diagrams, uh, the P equals infinity here if you have a collection of numbers and you take the infinity norm, that's just the maximum, which is terrible because it forgets about all the other numbers. It just looks at the number as the biggest one. So if you have two persistence diagrams that are kind of very close together, then that's maybe good. Like knowing the infinity norm is small is, is really strong, but if, if, they're not close together, if the infinity norm is large, then that's kind of really weak. Uh, so the P equals one norm is the best one because it just adds up all those numbers. So it's kind of the strongest. Uh, it's the most discriminative uh, of, of those metrics. Uh, so we have this one parameter family uh, and there, there's a, there's a total ordering of them from kind of a statistical point of view and how discriminative they are. Uh, with one being the best, infinity being the worst. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but often we can, but in some cases, all of them have uh, the same properties, but uh, for specific things, some of them might have different properties than other ones. Thanks for that question. I had, I had one other one, which is, the, is there any kind of topological characterization of these metric spaces that show, you know, the persistence metric spaces? Are they sigma compact, for example? Do you know it? Uh, great question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, that is a very recent result of my student, Irena Hartsock, uh, uh, which hasn't yet appeared. Uh, so if the um, yes, so there, there, I mean, there's some technical, so as for the case of persistence diagrams in the upper half plane, uh, they are sigma compact uh, for all P. I hope I'm saying that right. 
I don't know if Arena's out there somewhere. Maybe she'll correct me. Uh, uh, and what, she, what, she, what she's actually looked at is doing this in the general setting that I talked about at the end, which is that we just have a metric pair. Uh, and uh, so the question is, how does the topology of the metric pair affect the topology of the persistence diagrams? Uh, so she's looked at this very exhaustively uh, uh, under lots of metric properties. And uh, yeah, she's written it all up. She's waiting for her advisor to, uh, <laughs> to take a look at it and put it on the archive. So hopefully that'll be ha happen sooner rather than later. Thank you. So th there was a question in the chat a little while ago about the categorical structures on, on I don't know if I'm saying this right, MIP pairs. So you, you had talked about the symmetric monoidal structure, but the, the question, are, are there more structures like braiding and duality and things like that? Um, good question. Uh, so, uh, so let me find the slide here. Um, Anderson, if you want to ask that, that question more specifically, feel free. Yeah, so uh, so it's a symmetric monoidal structure. Um, I mean, so braiding is more general than that, so we, we don't need to do that here. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's, I don't think there's more I can say than that. Uh, Peter, I got another question coming in in the chat. Uh, in practice, which kinds of measurements give rise to WP stable information of persistence diagrams? Uh, great question. Uh, so this is a good question that uh, was just given a satisfactory answer very recently uh, by Catherine Turner and Primo Scraba. And uh, so they showed that uh, in most, in many practical situations, uh, the WP uh, Wasserstein metric is also stable. So the stability theorem that I gave you um, was just for the, the P equals infinity case, which as I confessed, was kind of the weakest one. Uh, now, gromov hausdorff distance is also kind of a weak distance. And it's kind of, uh, this theorem also just applies to the setting where we have point clouds. Um, so, so let me tell you about the setting of their theorem, which appears in a lot of cases. Let's say we have some sort of fixed complex. Uh, for example, we have a, a digital image, grayscale digital image. We have a bunch of pixels on the screen with grayscale values of them. Uh, so there's a bunch of vertices, edges, and cubes, all of which have real numbers attached to them. So this is a filtered cubicle complex. Uh, we can do persistent homology on that, sublevel set persistence, and we get a persistence diagram. And the recent theorem, about a year ago now maybe, is that the P Wasser, if we perturb that image by a little bit by epsilon, in the P norm. So we have a collection, each pixel has a number. We take the P norm of that list of numbers uh, or the difference of those numbers. That P norm gives us a bound on the P Wasserstein distance of those persistence diagrams. All right, uh, there, there, I think there's a constant there has, having to do with the geometry of the integer lattice. 
if you change one pixel, I think you can actually end up moving three dots in the persistence diagram. <laughs> Uh, so there's a three that shows up there. Uh, but there's this really nice sharp theorem for the, the P Wasserstein distance uh, coming from complexes, filtered complexes with the P norm on their values. Thanks. I think I've got a follow up question to that, which is in practice, what would correspond to the perturbation of the pixels being P bounded? Sorry. I, I, maybe I misspoke. Let me try to say that more carefully. That if uh, we don't want to, if we take some image and we perturb each of the pixels by some amount and we look at the list of numbers of all of those perturbations and we take the P norm of that list of numbers. So we have a N by M image, we have N M epsilon sub I's. Uh, we take the P norm of that, the, that vector, uh, that gives us an epsilon. Uh, that epsilon gives us a bound on the P Wasserstein distance of the two persistence diagrams. Uh, that's the bound I was talking about. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Rashad, do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. Uh, so I'm an undergrad, so sorry if my question is a little ill-informed, but- I apologize um, for questions. All questions are great questions. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, um, the uh, so from what we discussed today, it kind of seems like the antithesis of all this is the problem of adversarial learning in machine learning, um, because you have like small perturbations in your data kind of to massive um, changes, which is kind of why I asked the question about the Viator's grips, because just because you have a triangle doesn't mean you don't have a weird spike in the middle of the triangle, um, which would mean that you can't really fill it in. Um, is, there, is there work done um, to apply TDA to adversarial learning or um, ways to tackle or kind of explore the area a little bit? A great question. Uh, so, so one thing I'd like to uh, say is that these stability theorems, uh, so one interpretation of them is that they are proofs that these methods are uh, resistant uh, to adversarial attacks. Uh, so because the output is stable with respect to small perturbations of the input, uh, you have a theoretical guarantee that an adversary cannot change your input by a tiny amount and force you to get a very different uh, answer. Okay, so uh, so this is something that I, I think is a, a very strong thing that we are able to do as mathematicians is, is to have these types of results. Uh, so uh, I guess now, uh, the problem I see is that uh, in, in your theorems you're perturbing your uh, persistence diagrams, but I'm kind of talking about what if you perturb your actual um, underlying complex or data or what, what have you. So the, I guess I'm, I'm confused as to what you mean by the underlying data. So uh, 
I mean, typically I think of the input as either being the filtered simplicial complex or uh, some simpler mathematical structure that uh, gives rise to that simplicial complex. So in the stability theorem that I gave you, uh, let me see if I can find it again. Um, the underlying input was a collection of points in a metric space or a, a metric space X. Uh, and now if we perturb that point cloud by epsilon in the gromov hausdorff sense, that gives us a bound on how much the persistence diagram will change in the infinity okay. lesser side metric sense. Okay, I just misread the, the theorem there. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you very much. Okay, but th thank you for bringing up that point, that was, that was great, thanks. Yeah, maybe we should mention that uh, part of our original intent in having these extended uh, question uh, sessions was that you know, during the ordinary uh, in-person conferences, we, um, we tend to try to build in a lot of time for interaction among the participants, both with the speaker and with each other. So uh, if we're starting to run low on questions for Peter, this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, just questions for Peter. Um, you know, we can feel free for this to be more of a, a discussion if other folks uh, work in this area and have things that they want to contribute or if uh, anybody just has general questions um, for, for the participants at, at large. Or we can keep asking Peter questions, that's fine too. Now that you've said that, I do have a question for Peter. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, but this is, I guess this is a kind of a general question. Um, so the stability theorem you, you showed is, is great, but the sort of common, the common issue that some folks raise with it is that it's, it doesn't have stability under what I would call salt and pepper noise. In other words, if I'm allowed to add a point, right, then stability goes away. Um, I was super curious to hear what in your mind are the sort of leading ways to handle that problem in TDA, the, the problem of a single outlier point causing trouble with the RIPS complex? All right, fantastic question. <laughs> uh, yes, so, so this type of stability theorem, and I, you need to, let me help you be a skeptic looking at this theorem. Uh, and and this, is, this is what Thomas was, was getting at is that this type of theorem is only good as good as the metrics that you're using. And so we already discussed about the metric on the left-hand side as being kind of weak in a certain way. Uh, the bigger problem, which is what Thomas is alluding to, is that the metric on the right is too strong. Uh, being so mathematically, we kind of think of gromov hausdorff distance as being kind of this maybe abstract, weak kind of distance. But uh, from an applied point of view, it, it is very strong in a certain way. And that uh, if we have one point, if we add one point that's far away, uh, that makes a huge difference to the gromov hausdorff distance. All right, so all of a sudden that bound becomes kind of useless. And, uh, and I will talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the, a big problem with everything that I presented so far. Uh, I would say that there are simple ways to fix things and that is mostly what is done to stay within this framework. Uh, you do some pre-processing to get rid of outliers. And that is a crucial part. Uh, if, you're, if you want to apply these ideas for the first time, there's lots of software out there to get going. You can do it yourself. You can give it to undergrads to play with. Um, 
But if you're working with real data, almost always you need to do some pre-processing to get rid of, do things like get rid of outliers. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of that pre-processing is kind of an ad hoc by hand heuristic procedure. And as a mathematician, I mean, one of the whole purposes of persistence is to do things less ad hoc, do things more globally. I'd love to do pre-processing globally. Uh, so that is something that I'll discuss tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I maybe won't say any more about that right now, but thanks for, uh, thanks for helping line up my talk tomorrow. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, someone's ringing. So in, another question in the, the chat uh, is a general question on TDA. Are there any examples of studies or data or TDA works better than other known methods to analyze data, such as clustering, or et cetera. Uh, sorry, can you say that one more time? Um, yeah, I think the, the the asker is basically saying, you know, when does when does TDA give better results in sort of a real life example than than other types of data analysis? Um, great question. Uh, Uh, well, one is one technique better than another. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, TDA is not going to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> okay. It, it's a great tool for certain situations. Uh, I think it's more of a specialized technique than an all-purpose method. Um, what are the downsides? Well, the main downside is that to do something like computing homology is expensive. It's a nonlinear, intrinsically nonlinear method. It's going to be more expensive than things that just require counting or linear methods. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's kind of like doing calculus, like, uh, when do you want to do calculus rather than just do linear approximation? Like, when do you want to use quadratics instead of lines? And the answer is only when necessary. <laughs> I mean, if you can do things linearly, do things linearly, and that will probably work 90% of the time and give you 90% of the answer. Uh, but when that's insufficient, then we want to use quadratic methods. Uh, and they're gonna be more expensive. Uh, so uh, TDA, I mean, will be useful in situations where we kind of wanna dig deeper than just doing linear methods. And um, the good news is that there's been lots of computational advantages, advances that are increasing the scope of using these kind of more mathematically more sophisticated methods with increasing numbers of data. Uh, and the other good news is that uh, people in the applied sciences are asking more and more sophisticated questions and getting more and more complex data. So the scope for using more sophisticated mathematical methods is, is greatly increasing. Uh, so even if TDA is only the right tool in 1% of situations, uh, that is still probably covering more data than there are topologists out there interested in doing this kind of thing. Uh, so, so there's lots of scope for, for both applying these methods and, and for developing theory in a way that hopefully will be useful. So my own jump off on that question, is there an example that comes to mind for you of a specific case where TDA found something that folks hadn't recognized using traditional data analysis techniques? Um, certainly. Uh, so, uh, well, you asked me to pick and choose my favorites. Uh, yeah, do we, do we have a killer 
application yet? Maybe no, to be honest. Uh, I would, so there's a famous case that's, that's been held up a bit that's a bit older now. Uh, there's another tool in TDA that's, that doesn't use homology, something called Mapper, which uses uh, kind of something called Reeb graphs or kind of building simplicial complexes out of data. It's kind of a data visualization tool. And it's had a number of successes, uh, one of which is kind, it's kind of a, a fancier way to do clustering using topology. And they were able to look at breast cancer data and give kind of a, a global view of breast cancer that was useful to oncologists and kind of categorizing or clustering breast cancer. Uh, now, of course, you can always say, well, other methods uh, in retrospect could have uh, found this kind of same kind of information. Uh, but I, I think they definitely pointed out some useful ideas uh, that were novel at the time. And, and that methods had many uses. Um, now using homology uh, is, has it had scientific, big scientific breakthroughs? Uh, I, th I think it, its best uses maybe have been in kind of enhancing uh, existing methods. Uh, so, so people doing biological imaging, for example, uh, which is a huge subject, <laughs> scanning people's bodies and, and get, giving images that are, are faithful and informative to physicians wanting to regret, having to decide on treatments that are life, potentially life-saving or deciding on surgery. This is kind of an important thing. Uh, there's fine scale structure in organs that you want to, that are topological and you want to have kind of faithfully represented. And, and people like Chao Chen uh, have topological methods for uh, having better reconstructions of those biological structures. Uh, and, uh, and I think with all of these things, it's still kind of early days. Uh, TDA is a complex tool and it requires quite a bit of time to convince people on the practicing end to make use of it, especially when they're kind of building these things into production level things that are making decisions that have a lot of money and uh, real world uh, implications. So uh, I think we're just kind of starting to make those connections and, and, and we are. Uh, one, one big tool on the applied end is deep learning. Uh, which has had huge impact and it's a very linear method. Uh, it just uses linear algebra matrices uh, together with a single nonlinear thresholding function souped up to extraordinary processing power. It's able to make fantastic decisions. Uh, recently, people have come up with great ways of starting to incorporate topological data analysis into that pipeline. Uh, and actually something I had, uh, uh, in particular, <laughs> there's, there's recently something called PLA, which uses persistence landscapes as a layer for deep learning. Uh, so this is developed by a group at Carnegie Mellon. Um, they have a paper in NIPS last year. Uh, and uh, and because the persistence landscapes are piecewise linear functions, they actually fit very nicely into the, the deep learning paradigm uh, because uh, deep learning is all about something called back propagation, which is just computing derivatives. Uh, you wanna know how is the output related to the input. Uh, you have all these linear operators, it's all about computing derivatives very quickly using GPUs and 
uh, since persistence landscapes are piecewise derivative, they fit very nicely into this framework. Uh, so uh, this is brand new. I think I think there's lots of scope here for uh, for using this kind of as a as a beachhead for kind of uh, strengthening connections between these methods. And of course, deep learning has been hugely useful. So uh, this would be one way of, of getting our method, our kind of results into, into those, into that body of, into that pipeline. Well, Peter, thank you.